video in the series on the method analysis of variance. Uh, this video is going to talk about the assumptions behind analysis of variance, but I'm, I believe that the word assumptions is a little foreign in the case of models for students new to the world of statistics. So I'm going to try to define the word assumptions first, and then I'll go into a list of three assumptions behind the model for analysis of variance. So in the world of statistics, people develop models to help answer questions like, are all the means the same, or is at least one mean different? That is the natural null and alternative hypothesis for analysis of variance. And the way they go about doing that is theorizing that there is some world of ideal data. And when the data are ideal, this model will perform well, like it can help you identify when at least one mean is different, when in the true population at least one mean is actually different. That is the data and the popul uh, the data on the sample side and the population agree. So when the sample data and the population kind of have this good correspondence, then we say the model fits well, and it will fit well under the scenarios of ideal data. So what we have is ANOVA fits the world best under ideal data. And so really, what we're going about um, affirming here with the word assumptions is the statements that define the word ideal. So in this case for analysis of variance, when we are trying to address the question, is at least one mean different from the rest, we are going to theorize that there is this world of ideal data. The assumptions are statements that define the word ideal specific to analysis of variance. That is, in this class, we will see new models as we finish up this semester. And for each new model, there is going to be new assumptions, that is, new statements that define what ideal data looks like for each new model. OK, so let's draw a picture. Because I think a picture is the best way to communicate the assumptions behind analysis of variance. So here is a common graph you should keep in mind for analysis of variance, where you have some numeric response variable y on the x on the y axis, <laughs> silly me, and you have some categorical explanatory variable on the x-axis. And your categorical explanatory variable has, let's say, three levels. So what we're implicitly doing is trying to ask the question, is one of the means different for the different levels of the categorical variable x? Now, ideal in the world of analysis of variance actually assumes that all of the data within each level are normal. So I'm going to draw it kind of sideways because we're to think that there's a normal distribution over the data on the y-axis. So this distribution is actually relative to all the observations in the level A for the numeric variable y. 
So here we have normal data centered at the mean for the level A. And ideal continues to mean for us in the world of NOVA that for each level, in fact, we have normal data. Whoops, that last normal distribution isn't great, but I think you guys get the idea. So the first assumption of analysis of variance is normality. And what we mean by that is the data within each level are approximately normal, but they usually just say normality. Okay, the next assumption states that the variation within each level is the same. So whatever that width is for level A, let's just call it sigma for the standard deviation for level A. Whoops, that's not where I usually write it. Let's write it here. So whatever that variation is, sigma for level A, that same variation exists for all of the levels. So we can just call that same variation, but really what we mean to say is it's the same variation for each of the different levels of the categorical explanatory variable x with respect to the numerical variable y. The third assumption is not easiest to visualize, but I'm going to draw. OK, so let's make this a line just so we can say the mean is there. I'm going to draw dots underneath these distributions to represent data from that distribution within each level. So if we observe a bunch of data within each level, the last assumption of analysis of variance says we don't want any particular observation, say that one, to be related in any meaningful way to any observation in another level. And that should extend in multiple different ways. We don't want any particular observation from level A to be related to any particular observation in level C or level B. We don't want any of our data to be related. What we want is to have independent data, that is data that is randomly sampled from our true population. We want data that essentially contains no siblings. If you're looking at something like humans, we don't want, you know, my sister in level A, me in level B, and my brother in level C, because then there would be some sort of relationship, i.e. not independence, between individual observations. And that's not what we want. We want all of our data to be independent, totally unrelated to each other. Okay, so those are our three assumptions that define for us ideal data. For whatever observations we have in each of the levels, we want the observations to be approximately normal, we want the observations to have roughly the same standard deviation, and we don't want any of our data to be inherently related to each other in any kind of meaningful way. We just want these to be completely randomly sampled data. Now, there is things we can look for when we plot the data. And this is largely why I encourage us to plot the data so much in this class, is because we can approximately check these assumptions with any of the various plots that I've recommended for analysis of variance. So here we are in R, continuing our example from earlier, where I'm interested in assessing the mean brain to body weight ratio across families in the order carnivora. And what I want to figure out is if the mean of each family for the numeric response variable brain to body weight ratio 
is roughly the same, or if there's evidence that at least one of the means differs. Now, if you look at this plot, which has violin plots representing, as best we can with the data we have, the population distribution for Canada's brain to body weight ratio, at least for Canada, we have roughly symmetric data. Because it's basically symmetric, we can assume normality is reasonably fit within the level Canada. But consider, for instance, Felidae or Viveridae, which appear to have, okay, here's your pop quiz for this video, is this long tail defining right or left skew? Indeed, it's right skew. As the numbers get bigger, the tail extends. So this is right skew because Felidae and Viveridae both have some right skew. The assumption of normality is not great in the case of these two levels. But for the most part, for all the other levels, the assumption of normality is fine. So in this case, I'd probably say the assumption of normality is okay. When in doubt, as long as your sample size is relatively large, then we remember that the sampling distribution of the sample mean will look approximately normal. What was the grand theorem that told us that? Oh, right, the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem tells us that even if our data are somewhat skewed, the sampling distribution represented by this confidence interval here, just within the violin plot, will be approximately normal. Even if the population is heavily skewed, as long as our sample size is relatively large, then the sampling distribution for the sample mean will be approximately normal. So normality is a crucial assumption for analysis of variance, but as long as your sample sizes are relatively large, there's not a too serious a concern about the assumption of normality. So in this case, I'd largely say it's met. The assumption of normality is met because most levels appear to be approximately normal. Some levels don't, but our sample size is not small. It's, I'd say, like medium-ish. Okay, so normality seems okay. The next assumption I listed was same variation. So that is something roughly like the standard deviation here is equal to the standard deviation here, equal to the standard deviation here, 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 and here, or at least that's what it's supposed to be. But notice some levels here have almost no standard deviation. In fact, there's only one observation for a Lourdes. And some, and some levels have very small variation, while some levels have very large variation. So in this case, I'd say the assumption of the same variation within each level is broken. The way I generally judge the assumption is by looking at one of the smaller levels variation. So I'm going to pick out hyena day and I'm going to say, OK, it's got general, I don't know, range based on this violin plot. I'm not being super formal here because I want you to be loose in this um, checking this assumption. The, something like the range here is from 2.5 to 5. So let's just call it 2.5. I'm OK with stretching the assumption of same variation so long as the different the ratio between the smallest variation group and the largest variation group is something like four times so let's check that if this from this lighter line to this um, bigger line is like one unit which measures two and a half then four times that would be one two three four so it looks like hyena day relative to fela day is okay in terms of my let's stretch the assumption of same variation. But comparing the variation from a hyena day and even giving it this you know, room for error on four times the difference to Mustela day does not seem like it fits the my wiggle room estimation, which is, to be honest, very imperfect and kind of made up. 
So I would say the assumption of same variation is not met here. Your inevitable question then is, well, what should I do? And it turns out there's just a different test, Kruskal.test in R, that performs calculations similar to analysis of variance when the assumptions of analysis of variance aren't broken. But let me clarify, really only when normality and or same variation are broken. That comment is getting a little long, so let's put it up here. Only when the assumptions of normality and or same variation are broken, you can try Kruskal.test. Kruskal.test does not help you out if you have dependent data. That is, if you have not independent data, Kruskal.test will not help you out. But in this case, Thalidase are not related to hyenidase, and hyenidase are not related to canidase, and canidase are not related to ursidase in any kind of super meaningful way. So I'm going to assume the assumption of independence here is good. We already talked about the assumption of normality. It seemed good. The only assumption broken here is same variation. And in that case, Kruskal.test is a reasonable alternative to the standard analysis of variance. So you can run the test and you get out some output. The most important number here is your p-value, which you can use to determine the same null and alternative hypotheses that we saw in the standard analysis of variance. So in this case, remembering our scientific notation, this is really move the decimal place over one, two, three, four, five places. So it's like 0 0.00001 eight. Well, that's a number much smaller than our level of significance, so we can conclude that the alternative hypothesis seems the more likely choice, that at least one mean is different from the rest. And luckily for us, that's the same choice we made from the standard analysis of variance. So in this scenario, we have two tests, both the Kruskal-Wallis and our standard analysis of variance, confirming that at least one mean seems different from the rest for these data. If you're not sure if your data appropriate for analysis of variance break any of the assumptions, then you can just simply run both tests. And what you hope for is that your two tests both agree in terms of the uh, decision to be made from your hypotheses. If you end up in a weird situation that is totally possible, but not great, where one test rejects HO and one test fails to reject HO, my complete suggestion to you is consult a statistician. <laughs> so I'm trying to give you some good tools here to help you through understanding analysis of variance and its assumptions. That is the statements that define what ideal data look like in the world of analysis of variance, but ideal never happens in real data sets. So I've introduced you to some wiggle room on understanding when the assumptions are broken and not. Like normality is generally pretty lenient, same variation, is a little bit less lenient, but you can kind of use this four times rule. And if after you go through all the wiggle rooms on all the different assumptions, you are still aren't satisfied with your assumptions, here is a follow-up test to try for analysis of variance. What you hope is that the two tests agree that both p-values indicate whichever hypothesis is the more likely given the data you have. When the p-values, when and if the p-values do not agree between these two methods, I highly recommend you consult a statistician.